And at the point where you joined the process, yes. how much was kind of already there? or was it? Really we had just one A4 no? piece of paper, which I've still got at home. Um, and I, it's published somewhere. I think, I, it did, was it published in Russell's book? Or was it, or it, anyway, one of the books is his kind of uh, document for his overview of, this, of what the series would be. And it talks about Rose and her family and, it, and, and some of the places that they'll go and see. And that's all we had. We'd just that and lots of enthusiasm and a lot of stupidity and, 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 and yeah, that, but, but that was it. There was just that. And so we had to learn or, well, not learn. We had to kind of just work out how we'd make this show because it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a kind of tentative step into, in, into remaking Doctor Who at all. Not from the very beginning, you know, Russell's vision was never, well, we'll do six episodes and we'll set them in Hackney, you know, and maybe... Um, you know, maybe a monster that actually is a robot that looks like all of us will come and, you know, maybe they'll shoot a few people. It was never that. You know, it was always great big monsters under the London eye and, and space stations in the far future and, and, and zombies. You know, it was always that from the very beginning, really. We've already kind of referred to, to Russell, but I think it's kind of worth saying a little bit more about, obviously, Russell, who um, can't be with us today, but actually, you know, is... is, is really the reason that we're kind of all here today kind of celebrating the show and its 50th anniversary um, and he obviously incredibly kind of hands-on and committed and dedicated person um, from kind of from your point of view as a director um, how, how much kind of freedom does working with Russell give you as he is kind of so hands-on um, it's difficult to answer that I don't know that you need a lot of freedom as a director when you've got scripts like that the, the ones that invite a lot of freedom where you need to change a lot of stuff is frankly when the scripts aren't working when I when I was about to shoot the first Dalek episode, not the ones you've seen here, um, episode six, I was in you know, pre-production and I read uh, Russell's pilot script, the first episode, Rose, you know, for, for Doctor Who. And you know, I'm a writer myself and I've you know, written stuff on TV and you just read a script like that and it really makes you think, you know, I've got a way to go <laughs> as a writer. You know, it was, everything's there. And, and looking at those episodes again, it's, he's kind of incredible, both in terms of how, you know, I am a science fiction fan and he gets all the science fiction beats right and all the action beats, but also, really importantly, he gets all the emotional beats. And there's some really kind of powerfully moving parts in those two episodes, not having seen them for a long time, and in the other, and in the other episodes as well. And I think that's really, to me, the key of the success is that, you know, he's, um, he's just got, for me anyway, as, as, a, as a viewer, he's got perfect pitch in those kind of moments in terms of never getting it, letting it get too kind of um, somber and self-indulgent, you know. <coughs> But he, for my money anyway, he puts the gags in the right point. You know, you'll have the Doctor, you know, you don't often see these episodes with a big audience. You see it at home either by yourself or with a few kind of pals. And it's really, um, it's really nice actually to see it with a lot of people and see where the laughs are, you know, and to, just to remind it how funny and clever a lot of his writing is, that you could have the Doctor in the middle of a serious speech about how Earth has gone to shit and then breaking up and saying, what about that program about the bear? Wasn't that great? You know, and, <laughs> and again, you've got a fantastic actor who can do those hairpin turns as well and take you... Take, take you with them. So it's, you know, freedom, I, I wouldn't say, I would say no, but that wasn't really a bad thing. You know, I mean, where, where the freedom comes in is trying to solve technical problems, you know, so that Dave Houghton will testify, you know, in the first Dalek episode, people have been machine gunned all over the place and there just frankly wasn't the money to have loads of bullet hits on a Dalek. So it may have been Dave, it may have been one of the other effects team who came up with the idea, well, let's have a force field and let's have the bullets dissolve matrix-wise. And that looks really good and that's a, a really cool solution. Or in that last episode when they're trying to tug the console off the, um, off the TARDIS, I think as originally written... Um, Rose's mother gets a load of her friends in with different cars, and there were going to be four or five cars with four chains kind of pulling away. But actually, the big yellow lorry is a better gag, you know? And Brilliant. You know, Do you remember she was sitting on someone's knee? I was thinking she, that while she I was couldn't drive. drive. She, was she sitting, couldn't drive she, the van. She couldn't drive, so we had, to get, we had to get a driver dressed all in black, including in black a black glove. <laughs> And I saw that, and I think I laughed for 20 minutes. I, know, I, know. I saw the rehearsal, and I think I laughed for 20 I, minutes. Can you imagine? She had to sit on the sky. I can't drive it, darling! <laughs> and then give an emotional speech. You know, but it's, yeah. full, it's, it's full of all that kind of stuff. You don't really know what people are doing behind the scenes in order. You just think someone gets out of the car. You've no idea the bizarreness that is sometimes there to solve that. <laughs> so you, you just touched, actually, just before that on the episode Dalek, and that is the episode where we meet Adam, Bruno's character. And um, Bruno obviously... 
you were kind of born around the time when the show first time round was kind of coming to an end. About 83? Um, 89, I think it came to an end. So, but you would have been very young when it was kind of coming to, you know, to very an end. Very young, yeah. yeah. Um, so, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, did you kind of really have an idea of kind of what you were letting yourself in for? Obviously, Coronation Street was massively successful yeah. and you've got a, a big following from that, but this obviously has its own kind of set of, um, of, of fans and so forth. No, I didn't, I didn't really know what I was let myself in for I kind of I, it was kind of like a ride I kind of arrived in Cardiff and got on this ride sort of you know got got to work with these great actors and great people um, uh, and you know I like Joe said the scripts were so good and when getting on the set we, we didn't rehearse we just went and did it because the scripts were were brilliant as they were um, I just feel fortunate to be part of such a just a great team you know watching them on the big screen was amazing um, got my little boy here today he's he's six so he's watching it some of these for the first time so mm. Got Freddie over yeah, there. Yeah, Gonna give away Freddie. Hey Freddie. There we are, away from Freddie there. So it's great to sort of pass it on to different generations, you know. And can you remember about the actual kind of casting process, about sort of um, what happened and what you had to do? I just I just went in and read uh, for Andy Pryor, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. For Andy, so I, I must have read and done a good job. And um, hey presto, you know, that's the actor's job. You know, we just go in and audition. You either get it or you don't. And uh, I, was, <laughs> I was very happy that I did. And, and did you know at the start because obviously the audience kind of tease that you are going to be the next companion and in a sense you are, you go on to the next episode and, and, and you're yeah. taken to another world and so forth and then at the end it all kind of falls apart but as, as an actor did you know that it was a two episode block or were you expecting that it could have gone on longer? No, it was or? always going to be two episodes but everyone, everyone always asked me whether you know, I knew whether it was going to go on or not but no, it was always two. So, One of the big, big differences between when the show existed previously and, and now is obviously that the internet has become like this kind of this phenomena. And in terms of secret, in terms of secrecy and so forth, and, and in terms of you know trying to film stuff without the world getting you know knowing about it, and, and, and sort of you know when you've got the Daleks coming back and your you know and, and your leading man is leaving and regenerating and all these different things that are kind of going on. I mean, how did you kind of um, approach that in terms of secrecy? How did you kind of deal with? what you couldn't, you know, sort of couldn't... Well, we tried to do a secret bit of filming for the regeneration. You know, there was a fake scene written where, you know, the, the supposed end of the series was the Doctor looking in a monitor and finding out that uh, Rose had some fatal illness, I think, wasn't it? And that, <coughs> that was a, a kind of dummy scene, but we had to actually film it to make people think that it was the real scene, which is very weird, because when you're on such time pressures and budget pressures to kind of have to spend half a day on something that you know is just there. But it was, it was, it was worth doing. It was, there was a, a noble reason behind it. And the actual scene that you saw, we filmed um, minus David Tennant. We filmed late at night with a skeleton crew um, where we were all doubling up doing different roles in order to try and keep it secret. Of course, the next day, everybody who wasn't invited to the secret filming said, how did the secret filming go? Yeah. <laughs> so it wasn't very successful. And, oh, um, well, secret filming that then, I say. And, yeah. if, and in fact, it was, it got out into the press somehow. Uh, I mean, we, we even, the editing of that, you know, we, we cut the scene in secret, did all sorts of things, but uh, it's very hard to keep. You, you did manage it, though, in the full series. You had an extraordinary, almost regeneration with David Yeah, Tennant. well, that was amazing. I mean, I, we worked really hard. I won't lie to you, we worked really hard. And we <coughs> drilled it into people that they must keep secret what they were working on as much as we possibly could. We watermarked everybody's scripts, which sounds like an easy thing to do, but it was, re it, you know, it, it meant that the, that the girls working in the production office, you know, probably had to do four times the work that they would ordinarily do, printing everybody's script by hand. And, and we, you know, we just, secrecy was paramount. And if we, and I think, you know, we weren't kind of autocrats about it, but we just, we, it, it just became part of the discipline of working on the show, and I think we did manage to keep some great big secrets, and it, and it was great, you know. I, and I always used to say it was, uh, you know, and of course things got out, and I just, I always used to just find it sad because I think, you know, I loved it when I was a boy, and I, you know, and I had no idea what Tom Baker was going to be doing from one week to the next, and who was going to come next, you know, and you'd die for those. Uh, BBC trailers to come on just to show you what was coming up next week and that's how you found out and it was so exciting um, and so we just wanted to preserve that because I know at some you know for some people at some points they kind of thought we were just spoil spots and we didn't want you to know about anything but um, uh, it was worth it when when you know episodes like uh, the, the, the almost regeneration happened and genuinely between episode 12 and episode 13, we gained two million viewers. Two million viewers extra turned up for that final episode. 
because they were excited and because they didn't know, because they actually genuinely thought that we'd, we'd pulled off the coup of the century and he was going to turn into David Morrissey and nobody would know, or whatever. <laughs> I, but, and genuinely people thought that was going to happen and I think it made a better viewing experience. I think that week was exciting and blistering and brilliant as a result of that and I think all telly should be like that and the internet should be banned daily. <laughs> <laughs> And Joe, um, as we heard in kind of Chris's statement at the start, obviously you and Chris kind of work very closely together, and the real kind of bond formed between you. And he obviously really, um, you know, sort of felt very strongly that you were the right director to work with, and he talks about that in, in, in the statement. But can you just sort of just share some of your sort of thoughts and, and memories about working with Chris on the show? Uh, nothing blindingly original. I mean, it was just it was he made it very easy. I mean, you know, by the time I joined and. Bearing in mind, we didn't have um, uh, we didn't have any rehearsal periods, so we were kind of all. I think we'd met maybe a couple of times before um, uh, I actually worked with him. Uh, the first time I, I bumped into him when he was jogging on the towpath somewhere around Cardiff, which was really weird. Mm. Um, and the second time, I think, was at the um, uh, the read through for Dalek, and um, they were both uh, both he and Billy were were very late because they were doing shooting on you know on a, on a previous episode. And <coughs> I do remember no one had thought to tell him that we'd uh, not just only got Nicholas Briggs, the voice of the Dalek there for the read-through, you remember this, we'd also got his voice modulator as well, turned up to 11. And the first Dalek dialogue in the episode Dalek is the Dalek screaming at full pitch. No one told <laughs> Billy or... So in the middle of the read-through, you know, they both just leapt out of their skins. Yeah. So it's quite, quite a nice way to... Um, I think you said, what, the F was that? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Booming out. So that was our, and, and then really the first, I think the first day I worked with him was in the uh, the Alien Museum, and uh, he had to look at a severed Cybermen head, you know, and, and he kind of, um, I think by that time, you know, he was, he, to me, he felt like he was really comfortable in the role. Um, he was always a complete and absolute trooper. I mean, the, you know, the hours and the schedule you know, were punishing, because it's, it's a very, uh, it's a very complicated show, and it's particularly, I think those kind of shows, I've done quite a lot of them, not just Doctor Who, and they're quite, um, they're quite hard on the actors, because... You will have to spend, you know, three or four hours on someone jumping through a window or an explosion, and the kind of the assumption, my assumption, the assumption is always they take a long time to do because they are technically difficult and sometimes they're dangerous, and you have to spend the time on them. Um, now, this little breakdown scene between whoever we can do that in half an hour because it's technically easy, you know, and so quite often, you know, you have to remind yourself as a director not to shortchange the actors in that situation that they're getting time to do their kind of emotional stuff as well. Um, but I have to say, you know, it was. Um, from my point of view, it was a very um, it was a very easy and harmonious shoot. There were there were a lot of laughs, even though it was kind of tough. You know, the schedule was kind of tough. We, we'd sometimes try and have a bit of fun. I mean, you know, the the opening of the uh, the, the Bad Wolf episode has got Davina McCall saying, "You're live on Channel 4000. Please do not swear." Um, we did a swearing version, and we tried <laughs> to keep it as long as possible until you know, just take it out. You know, it's not going to be on air. Just take it out. So you know, we had some laughs on set as well. Um, it was just, uh, you know, both, both he and Billy, really, really terrific people to work with. And at what point did you know that Chris wasn't going to do more than one series? I mean, was there always a sort of plan that he would develop and do a several, or at what point, did it, what, what happened around that? Well, I think, um, I think that we, we, d we only ever had Chris under contract for one series. Um, and, uh, I, I mean, it was such a brilliant piece of casting, I think. Um, even though I say so myself, uh, and there was a, a decision I was only obviously a little bit part of, but but I think he just swept aside <coughs> everybody's preconception of what Doctor Who's relaunch would be, what the tone of the show would be, how seriously you should take it. I think you know he he swept all of that that aside just by us casting Chris Eccleston and. And I think <coughs> that he, um, I, I don't know, you see, I like to think of it, I think it was perfect, because I think for, a br for the brand new audience that we obviously had to get, we cast a brilliant actor who, who came in and just from the minute, I think, I, I think he arrived on screen, just owned the part in a way that you could have only really uh, wished for. You know, and he owned the part, and then, and, and you know, you saw his entire life, and you saw him die all in the space of one year, and then you saw, once that would happen, 
how the show could then move on. And so if you were eight years old, it was perfect and brilliant <coughs> and exciting. And actually, what a way to end your first series with a complete change of character and, 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 and a brand new person saying, here we go, I'm, I'm someone new now. And, and, you know, and, and, and we didn't, obviously, it would have been lovely if he, if he had wanted to do more and if he'd gone on and done another series. Actually, there's something perfect about those 13, I think, and that is Doctor's Life. Yeah. Thank you.